Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be speaking with Dr. James Munich and Professor Leon Van Niepert. Gentlemen, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Excited to have you both on. We're going to be talking all things REBT, Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy, combined with psychological skills training. We're going to unpack a brilliant paper that you've co-written alongside our oh, regular guest of the Sports Psych Show, Dr. Martin Turner. We're going to unpack that paper. Uh, we're going to bring REBT and psychological sk skills training uh, alive for everybody listening in, uh, for coaches, for sports psychologists. I'm really looking forward to, to, to doing a bit of a deep dive on this one. Uh, before we get started, let's start with, with you, James. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about your work. Yes, um, I'm a recent uh, PhD graduate uh, where I examined uh, the effects of uh, preferential REBT versus uh, a mindfulness acceptance commitment approach. And um, my interest in REBT started at a young age. I actually learned it when I was about 12 years old. And my late father, who was a psychiatrist and a sports person, was uh, taught me the concept. I first didn't accept it. <laughs> and then years later, when I needed to use it, I I, I grew to 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 see its its power. You know, it's a simple idea, but not simplistic. It's rather brilliant. Um, and later on, yes, I was a, uh, in my career, I was a, um, early on, I was a powerlifter, competitive powerlifter, wow. but uh, was more seen as an administrator and a, and a mental coach. So that was, that's basically my background in a, in a nutshell. And I use, uh, you know, psychological skills training, or as we call it in South Africa, mental skills training. I, I use that mainly with underperforming uh, school children. So I apply that sports psychology principle to 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 academic performance. I enjoy that, and uh, I did work with a group of rugby players to increase their performance, their mental strength, which happened. And I once worked with the late Paul Avis, who was a Springbok and a, and a clinical sports psychologist to take a, a low cricket team to the top of the log um, in the university uh, circuit. So that's my background. You said you were, you were a power lifter. And um, I mean, people can't see you on the, the screen, but I can see that you definitely were a power lifter, <laughs> James. Uh, tell me a little bit about the psychology of powerlifting. I mean, when you reflect back when you were powerlifting, is it quite a psychological discipline, would you say? I would say it's a, it's unusual discipline. Um, okay. You know, early in one of my training, I was, uh, one of my, again, the, the, the late uh, Paul Avis asked me to show the tech test to a group of cricketers, just the mm -hmm. first card, and record their results. And uh, the, the cricketers um, were all very much uh, similar. When I showed it to some of my powerlifting friends, completely different, quite dark. <laughs> so I don't know if that reveals much of the, the psyche. But yeah, the, the, the psychology of powerlifting is different um, for, e for each person, you know, okay. the... the um, for me, you know, even though I'm REBT orientated, uh, when I did deadlifting, when you're picking up that heavy weight, for me, it went from self-talk of telling myself to push push my feet through the floor to basically thinking of nothing was when I <laughs> when I pulled the, the highest amount. But uh, yes, I only after my competitive days, that's when I learned sports psychology and then just taught the next generation some of those skills. But it would have been useful if I had known it at the time, uh, you know, to take visualization to the next level and, uh, yeah, psyching up, I uh, always knew how to do that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think uh, where REBT has been useful for me is the end of my career when I don't right. make it to the top and then age caught up with me and injuries and that learning you know not to base one's self-esteem on on um on one's strength or one's skills uh but like in a, an rbt context to accept yourself is not perfect and um 
yeah, to uh, accept yourself unconditionally. Uh, that's that's what's usefulness, I would say, technically is the end of a uh, of a career, most careers uh, in, in competitive sports. But uh, yeah, I digress. No, well, when you go on to introduce us to uh, rational emotive behavior therapy and its application in sport, perhaps you can use some of those examples from your powerlifting career, because that would be so fascinating for us to, to listen to. And um, on to Professor Leon Van Niekerk. Uh, Leon, it's wonderful to, to have you on as a, a guest of the Sports Psych Show. Uh, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and tell us a little bit about your work, that would be fantastic. So thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to be on, on the podcast with you guys. Yeah, I've got my PhD in counseling psychology. So in South Africa, we don't have sports psychologists. Okay. There are no registered sports psychologists in South Africa. Right. So I'm a counseling psychologist. And because the training needs and the process of training sports psychologists in South Africa is still lagging far behind, I did my master's degree in sport and exercise psychology in Belgium. So I, I, I did it there and uh, got qualified. And now I'm in South Africa and I'm working as a counseling psychologist at a university called the University of Fort Hare. It's right at the bottom of, of South Africa in a town called East London with its main campus about 110 kilometers from there, uh, a town called uh, Dikeni, uh, better known as Alice. In, 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 in the English language. And um, I was at the, the Department of Human Movement Sciences teaching sports psychology there, but now I've moved to the Department of Psychology. So I'm training psychologists at the moment uh, at the university, and I've joined the department recently uh, where James also got his PhD from. And that is, that's a bit more about my academic background. I was at the University of Johannesburg for 15 years, before I joined uh, the University of Fort Hare. With regards to, to, to my research, uh, the focus is primarily on, on development of adolescents. So a lot of mental skills training is, is what my focus was on. Uh, I am also involved with some of our national cricket players and uh, some of our Paralympic and Olympic athletes, see a few golfers. So, so the odd athlete here and there, because it's not my full-time job. Uh, my my counseling is just, just a part-time thing that I'm doing. Uh, I, am, I am the psychologist for our border female rugby team here in the Eastern Cape. And uh, I've worked with some of our provincial teams uh, more specifically, also some of our football teams, especially in Gauteng uh, and here in the Eastern Cape. So I've got a, a generalist approach to mental skills, and uh, I think a combination of mental skills, including uh, rational emotive behavioral therapy and mindfulness, is where I think athletes can benefit most. But but not too much about me any further. <laughs> I think I've touched on the most important ones. Well, before we dive into the um, the paper, Leon, I mean, you're a, a wonderfully experienced researcher and practitioner uh, based in South Africa. And when I think of South African sport, I think of the amazing rugby teams, uh, yes. much, much to the uh, uh, admiration, but slight annoyance of this Englishman. Uh, um, I think of the incredible cricket teams, um, Yes, you, you know, just, just amazing athletes in South Africa. What, what is it about South Africans? What is, what is it about the socio-cultural landscape perhaps that, that um, helps to produce amazing athletes. Sure. You know what, Dan, one of the most striking uh, characteristics of South Africans that stays with me all every time I watch them perform is their resiliency. Right. I must say we have enormously resilient athletes in South Africa, people who come from uh, very stressful and very challenging backgrounds who learned how to face challenges and how to become strong in adversity. So you will very rarely find a South African thing up early, you know, they fight right up to the end. Uh, and uh, 
uh, you know, if, if we talk about especially the equity and uh, uh, the redressing of uh, the ills of apartheid, uh, it's a pity that sports psychology was lagging so behind, especially in areas that are quite poor and uh, that are quite remote, because some of our stronger athletes come from those smaller towns where uh, they get the opportunity to to go to schools and to get into sport contexts that really push them forward and promote their development as athletes quite strongly. If we could have started sooner, uh, you know, I think it, it would have looked even better. But regardless of that, we are doing well. Some of our strongest rugby players, our black rugby players, come from the Eastern Cape where we are. It's, it's, a, it's a group of, of young people and a group of young men who really enjoy the game and love the game and really put their hearts into developing their skills to achieve in, in sport, especially in rugby. Um, yeah, I think our resiliency and, and our background really works well for us in, in this context. Well, I was in the stadium um, I believe it was the first game that a um, a black rugby player had capped in South Africa, Salisi. It was the Joburg test against England in 2018. I believe I'm getting that statistic correct. I was in the stadium because I was working with England rugby. And it was certainly a momentous day for South African rugby. And and, and, and to, to your point, um, you know, we can actually borrow from, I think, social identity theory um, in terms of, the, you know, that that sense of belonging, that, that socio-cultural sense of um, challenge and frustration and everything about the challenges that everybody has faced in, in South Africa. Uh, and that really comes through in that sense of belonging with the rugby mm -hmm. team. And I, as I say, I was in the, I was blessed to be in the stadium that day. I was disappointed with the final result because you beat us, <laughs> but it was an incredible game because never before, I think, as an England team won in, in the Joburg Stadium. Yeah. Um, uh, and we were something like 24-3 up in the first 20 minutes. I don't know if you remember this test. And then Faf de Klerk scored a try and you felt it in the stadium. The whole stadium erupted. And you yes. just thought, I was just thinking as the team psychologist, just hold on, manage momentum. <laughs> but then you scored again and then you scored again. And I think the final score was something crazy, like 49-47. It was an incredible yeah. game. Yeah. But um, it was a it was a, a momentous occasion, uh, Leon and James, because um, as I say, Salisi was the the um, captain, and what a captain he he is. Yeah, and and he's from the Eastern Cape as well. Okay, Siakulisi. Yeah, uh, he's, he's also from here. But but that is the that is what I'm what, what I'm suggesting when I talk about the resiliency. Mm. We never give up as a, as a group of South Africans. And I think the, the social integration and the challenges that they overcome as, as, as a rugby team representing a diverse number of people in our country, they're really doing well. Uh, and, and, and as soon as that momentum picks up, it becomes like a steamroller. And I think the mindset there is, is, is just one of fighting right up to the end we're not we're not rolling over for anyone even if we are behind quite significantly we push forward and we are going to beat this and and i think that in a sense is also part of the uh, of, of the motivation for the country as a whole regardless of our challenges and difficulties we push forward and we make it work and we find ways to, to, to beat the system and get out of the system that is uh, against us. And, and, and we push forward, even now with, with some of our national problems that we have, we're pushing forward and we're finding ways to make this work and uh, we're not gonna give in. So yeah, I, th I think uh, even in a cricket ex example of a few years ago, the Australians put up, I think about 500 and something runs and then the South Africans had to come in mm. with that enormous target set, and they did it. 
they, they beat the Australians, even, even with such a challenge close to them. Yeah. And I think that energizes our system quite significantly, is when there's a challenge and something to fight for and we'll do it together. And that, that sense of identity and belonging, I think, is a very strong part of it. Well, challenge and fighting and resiliency, as you've mentioned there, Leon, um, I suppose one could argue that there, um, there, there's a mental skills component to that, a psychological flexibility component to all of those things. And, and we're here today to talk about a brilliant paper that you've co-written alongside Dr. Martin Turner. Uh, this paper is entitled Recommendations for Integrating Psychological Skills Training into Rational Motive Behavioral Therapy. And I think we're all, we all here recognize that um, that's uh, a, a title that would lend itself to a sports psychologist listening in. But we're going to work hard not just to speak to our sports psychology audience, but also um, towards coaches and any other key stakeholders listening in. We're going to make bring this to, to life as much as we possibly can. So let's start unpacking that. Um, and obviously, we'll come to you, James, first, because you led this paper. And I'd love to know the genesis of the paper, how this started. And then we can start to talk about what rational motive behavioral therapy is. So can, can you give us a bit of a lowdown of the history of this paper? Why this paper? Yes, uh, well, it, it emanated out, out of two sources. First was uh, my PhD, where I, back in 2017, I started the paper. I wanted to test the effects of preferential uh, REBT, and I'll unpack that a bit later, um, uh, and compare it to one of the more third wave interventions, like uh, mindfulness based interventions. Um, and while preparing that paper, doing my initial review, um, I got interested in the compatibility of psychological skills training, uh, the, those canonical uh, skills, goal setting, self talk, imagery, relaxation, and concentration, and how they were compatible with. Uh, the, the most purest source of REBT, the preferential version of REBT, or, or sometimes called the specialized version, um, how compatible it was. And to use uh, what, uh, so, uh, some of your language, uh, the common language, was there any sort of common language between um, psychological skills training and REBT? And if not, how would we integrate the the approaches. Um, so while I was working on my paper and developing a, a seven-week REBT-centered program, which included uh, psychological skills training and that modification to make it integrate better, um, I think uh, Martin was working on his book, um, Rational Practitioner, yeah. and where my interest was more yes on the, the common language and human uniformity. His interest was particularly the ABC framework, or as he would call it, the GABCE framework. Um, and um, we can look at that uh, a bit later as well. But uh, so we, it was uh, when it came time for um, after my graduation, it just made sense that uh, well, we write a paper. <laughs> yeah. We went from there. Okay. Went, so, so given the audience that we have tuning in and i know there's going to be some people who know precisely what rebt is rational emotive behavior therapy um and others are not going to have heard of rebt at all james can you sort of introduce us to what rebt is rational motive behavior therapy is and then you've also used this word preferential preferential rebt so could you distinguish between the the two for us Yes, I can. So, yeah, the, with, the, with the history of REBT, it was first known as rational therapy and created by Albert Ellis, uh, later rational motive therapy, um, and then it evolved into rational motive behavioral therapy, which is most commonly what it's known as. Uh, some people talk about rational motive cognitive behavioral therapy, and then, but it's still mostly known as REBT. Now, Ellis himself, um, who is considered one of the fathers of CBT. Yes. He he himself distinguished between REBT, which he said was synonymous with CBT, and preferential REBT, which was the most developed version of his therapy. Um, 
And um, that's why I, I often use the term, which I inherited uh, from my late father, uh, preferred thinking. It's, it's almost the antithesis of positive thinking. Where positive thinking, you have to be positive all the time and make yourself artificially positive all the time. What Albert Ellis taught is sometimes it's appropriate to be a negative in a negative situation, just the, the degree of negativity and how it impacts your, your, your emotions and thus your performance. That's when it becomes troublesome. So preferential REBT, we can distinguish it from general REBT, where general REBT would be considered, uh, considering the, the thoughts and beliefs that affect one's emotions and how those emotions affect performance. Uh, preferential RBT is particularly interested in how dogmatic, absolute, rigid, uh, irrational beliefs, uh, the idea that I must win, I must succeed, or you must not, you must treat me well, you shouldn't tackle me so hard. Those things, what drive gross negative emotions like depression, anger, rage, uh, you know, those extreme negative emotions which distract one from concentrating um, and uh, affect performance. So, yes, so when I, I linguistically uh, teach uh, REBT, I teach, uh, I, I use the word prefer thinking. Uh, I know Martin uses the word smart thinking, uh, but it's, 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 you know, I'm emphasizing the, um, the, the flexible mindset as opposed to the uh, the, the bad four letter word of, of preferential REBT, which is obviously the must. <laughs> yeah. if, if, if it was a, a, a bad four letter word, it, it's must. And of course, uh, oughts and shoulds. So that is our focus as preferential REBT uh, practitioners is to get athletes to be less uh, dogmatic, less rigid in their thinking, less perfectionistic. Um, I remember years ago I had a TV, uh, I won't say which brand, but the, the logo was built by perfectionists. I thought, oh, it's not going to last. <laughs> and it it, it didn't. <laughs> uh, so there is, a, you know, athletes are generally high achievers and and, and perfectionists, but that, that can have its, uh, at some point it can become a problem um, in terms of performance. And yeah, I, I, I don't know if I uh, distinguish the two, uh, between general REBT and uh, preferential REBT, uh, um, clearly, um, I do know the paper. We we had limited space, so we didn't really go into it on that occasion. But that's basically what when I when I'm talking about uh, mental skills training and making compatible, it's for the more specialized uh, version of REBT that um, we are meeting. So, so just remind me. This is absolutely fascinating, and again. For, for those people listening in, for the coaches listening in, for the key stakeholders listening in, you spoke about Martin, Dr. Martin Turner, using the term smart thinking. What term did you use? Do you use, James? Preferred thinking. Preferred. Preferential thinking. Preferential preferred. thinking or preferred thinking. Yeah. And that's really what I hear. And maybe we might come to you here, Leon. What I hear is preferred thinking is or smart thinking is getting away from what might be considered the irrational language here the musts the have to's and i think this is fascinating my my lens of the world working for 20 27 years now in high performance sport is i think we're so socialized into those musts and have to's you know, we're speaking right now as the Rugby World Cup is going on, for example, and I'm pretty sure that if you speak to a lot of those players, they'll say, well, we must win. We have to win. <laughs> and, and, and yet we're sitting a negotiation. Here, well, we're sitting here as sports psychologists going, oh, well, you know, that might not be the best way to look at it. We might need to have some smarter thinking here or some preferred thinking. Um, what, yes. What's your thoughts on this, Leon? Uh, I'm always cautious when athletes and coaches start to define their thinking and their preparation for competition based on the outcome. Okay. If the mind jumps to that space, it'll have because that that is then then the activity you are challenged with in that sense. You, you have to then uh, uh, frame your approach to a game based on the end. And the end is not near. <laughs> <laughs> the end is sometimes still two seconds away. And if you don't use those two seconds 
properly, yep. focusing on what you are doing, and your mind leave that space, it'll have an effect on your performance. So yeah, I'm always cautious when, when the thinking pattern is based on the outcome. Then you have to bring those athletes and coaches back two steps to say, rather than thinking about the end, how can you focus on your plan? And how is thinking going to assist you to navigate the process of the play and the game that you're involved in? So I can I can imagine that all this talk about theory and the names REBT, ABC, all those things is a minefield for coaches and athletes. Yes, that that is part of of, of the psychologist. The back of my mind, my theory is there. Yes, what I have to deal with here is make sure the coach and the athlete know what I'm talking about. And the baseline for, for this kind of approach is that every situation you enter will generate the thought. You'll think th- something about it. And for, for most of the time, that thought is probably going to be judgmental about your ability, about how well you have prepared, about your view and your emotional engagement with this experience that you are entering a competition or whatever, a game. Let's talk about a game and how important that game is for you. The moment you run onto the field and you see the opponents and they are taller than you, your your mind will generate the thought based on how and what you think about yourself. Now, smart thinking from my perspective will mean You put that experience and event into perspective and you generate a thought that at least give you a chance. Because if you generate a thought that either creates a ceiling effect or is going to to preempt your thinking about the end, oh, I'm not going to win this game. That thought will direct your behavior. So peripheral thinking, perfectionistic thinking, those kind of thinking is not always the best way to go about if the thought is judgmental. And and that's why I think smart thinking is is a better way to go in terms of giving yourself a chance at least and not preempting or foreclosing the outcome in your mind already. So, So in terms of of preparing athletes, it's, it, it, it's about helping them to generate thoughts regardless of what they are going into. Hopefully they are well prepared and know what they are going into. To generate the kind of thoughts throughout the game that directs you towards moving forward. Even if you are in a challenging and adversity, how do I think myself out of that situation and generate my thoughts into action? that at least give me a chance. Even if I make a mistake, I've got another option. So that open mindset, I think, is more of an importance when we talk about REBT, the thinking process that gives me a chance. I'm backing myself with my thoughts is where my mind is going. An open mindset a flexible mindset coming back to you, James, as Leon was speaking there. Any any further thoughts from yourself? Um, no, um, I think uh, if we can, we can we can discuss the uh, ABC uh, framework uh, yeah. and put that in a, in a bit of a context. Okay? Yes. So for for uh, you know most people who are familiar with CBT uh, will know about the famous ABC that, that's uh, framework co- cognitive behavioral therapy CBT yes. cognitive behavioral yeah. therapy yeah yeah and uh, you know even though that's more generic they often do use Albert Ellis's uh, uh, ABC uh, framework which has evolved to to often include a G in front of the A. Um, so just to give people a bit of context, uh, G stands for a goal okay. or a value. And I think if you if you see most, you know, every time you, I've, you tend to start observing conflict in people and it's often two goals uh, clashing. You know, right. I want to score a try. You're stopping me scoring a try. 
and then there's two goals uh, are cl- and and that uh, can lead to an activating event where um let's say there there's there's a a, a punch up in a in, a, in a, on a on a rugby field yes <laughs> let's use that as an example so the activating event someone gets tackled awkwardly they take a swing at the other person and <laughs> that would be the uh, activating event or the adversity yes. yeah and uh, what that results is someone gets tackled awkwardly they take it personally um and then they get angry rageful and they uh, lose a penalty by you know causing a penalty by taking a swing at someone yes um that would be the consequence the emotional consequence in the, in the, the abc framework in between the activating event what happened and the and the uh, goal and the rage and the um angry behavior yep. um is one's beliefs about that situation at the time your thoughts and beliefs and normally uh, when you have a, a bad outcome a poor performance outcome quite often or not it's been driven by the c the consequence and it's normally um a gross negative emotion extreme negative emotion like anger or rage but it's the b that determines that that um the level of of the rage so if the person is irrational they think to themselves you shouldn't have ta- tackled me like that you know you shouldn't pick on me that mindset that belief system um is what triggers the consequence the emotional behavioral consequence so with within the framework we try and teach um the clients how to themselves eventually dispute and question those musts you know why is it the end of the world if i get tackled why mustn't I, 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 the person not leave my my jacket when i tell him to you know um it's you start questioning the rationality of your your be and that leads to a more flexible mindset and e a more effective um philosophy where you prefer that they you weren't tackled that way you prefer that they weren't trying to pick a fight with you on the rugby field you know uh but then you act in the most appropriate way you have the you might not be happy about it um uh but you instead of being angry you'll be annoyed we can again reset and focus on the game i don't know if that makes sense i love it Norm- yeah normally you know when a practitioner would be teaching this to 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 athletes and coaches they would be using uh, slides and a, and, a, and a whiteboard or something to explain the the different thing mm-hmm. the flow of of thoughts to feelings to behaviors but uh yeah that's a snapshot of mm-hmm. of uh, abc james there are two two examples from yesterday in the world cup that you watch Uh, I, I think the one example is is where the the Springbok team was going for a try, and then they were pushed out of the uh, the uh, the player was pushed out of the uh, the playing field, and immediately there was a scuffling because I think they're the, exactly what you are saying. The thinking at the time was this guy shouldn't have stopped me, and hmm. I should exactly. whatever the thinking was. But then the emotions hmm. were there, and 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 uh, we we know what happened there. um and the other example is that of the captain of the uh, the wells team right at the end of the first half he was so frustrated and i think it's because of the pressure of fiji i, th- i think they were playing fiji the pressure was so much and the players the welsh players was struggling and the guy didn't kick the ball out right at the end and he was so furious i think it was also a bit unprofessional of him and and he was screaming at his own teammate there at the end because of his thinking he was expecting something different and then it didn't happen and the emotions that come from that frustration that boils over was exactly because of the way he was thinking at the time and not the preferential or the smart thinking that we are talking about now that he could have employed and uh, i i'm i mean he's the captain and he's playing for quite some time already so one would expect that skill to have established itself already but we should not make that mistake because even in high pressure games when you have those skills and you come with a lot of experience the thinking is a devil sometimes it it, it catches you by surprise 
I, I, yeah, I agree. And I think context matters. As you say, this is the World Cup. This, mm. is, this is a big deal. And so subsequently, your capacity to dispute um, your beliefs in that moment or dispute what you're experiencing to deal with that situation in the moment is enormously tough. And this is an ongoing conversation, perhaps even sometimes debate I have with certain people in sports around, you know, the notion of who needs this and who doesn't need this. To me, everybody needs the tools to be able to think flexibly under pressure. And I think that in general, it's a broad brush statement, but in general, even at the adult elite end of sport, the professional end of sport, we're too laissez-faire with that. We're just, oh, well, you know, that person can do it. And it's like, we well, don't take this for granted because they might be able to do it in a normal league game, but once they get into an international setting and it's the World Cup, maybe they can't and they need mm-hmm. these tools. But to summarise what I both hear you say you know, entrenched in REBT, rational emotive behavior therapy, is this process G, A, B, C, D, E. G has been put in front of the A, B, C, D, E. The G stands essentially for goal. You also mentioned value there, but I have a goal. So if we come back to the Wales-Fiji game, the first game for the Welsh team in the World Cup that's just just happened as, as we're recording now, the goal was obviously, in broad brush terms, was to win. The activating event was actually that Fiji, the Welsh captain or Welsh players are playing, they're competing, and actually Fiji are uh, matching them uh, as the game unfolds. Mm-hmm. The belief underpinning is probably, well, we're really, we should be expected to beat Fiji, you know, no disrespect to Fiji, who are very, very good a rugby playing nation now, actually above England in the world rankings as we speak. But the belief is we should win. And so the consequence is frustration and maybe some anger. And maybe in that context, because it's the World Cup, where they maybe ordinarily would be able to dispute the D, the dispute, they'd be quick to do that. In this instance, they possibly weren't as quick as they should be. And so the effective uh thinking the smart thinking wasn't there so the e wasn't necessarily taking place but the better the better the disputation the better effective thinking coming back to you james have we teamed up there to neatly describe g a b c d e yes i i couldn't have explained that better myself that was that was a a a very good uh uh, a description of of the uh, G A B C D E. Um, yeah, just coming back to to integration. So uh, the the framework. Um, uh, let's start with the using uh, the, the the framework as a guide. You know, you've got G. Now Albert Ellis and, and his followers uh, have one of the underlying assumptions of R E B T is this idea that humans are goal orientated. So we know from from sports psychology the motivating effects of goal setting. Um, uh, as a student, I remember I I, I I wrote down sixteen distinct principles for effective goal setting. Uh, you know, most people would be uh, familiar with the smart goals, but there are other principles, as you know. Um, but I found it yeah very conducive to REBT, except sometimes when it came to the common language. Um, again. And that is a lot of times in the literature, the the musts, the oughts, the shoulds, the swear words of preferential REBT come out. And uh, so the most important uh, from an REBT uh, perspective in terms of principles of goal setting um, is, of course, flexibility of goals. You know, you can't, it's never case you must obtain a, a goal it's the end of the world um you must make first team you have to be get that gold medal um you know flexibility is good again there's a problem with athletes being uh, perfectionistic in their goal setting so that's the only thing to make it linguistically uh coherent um just when teaching that the skills of goal setting and the principles of effective goal setting in an REBT context, yeah, align the language. Um, just avoid teach avoid that must ought and should uh, on a, on a simple level, um, and then it's highly highly uh, uh, compatible with with REBT. 
Um, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, uh, James, this is where this is where mindfulness and uh, REBT, I think, uh, find common ground, and that is that the primary motivating factor for behavior is the goal that you have that you want to achieve or the value that you want to uh, present through your behavior and how you do things. You want to be known for this or want you, you want to be known as a person of integrity uh, and, and becoming that. Um, uh, where I think there, there, there is some form of integration that one can find there to say we, 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 both of these theoretical approaches start from the same vantage point. There's a goal, there's a, uh, there's, there's a specific value we want to achieve. And then the challenges that comes our way and the beliefs we have should align with that. And even if the challenges throw us off track sometimes, we have to find the skills and the mindset that will steer us back into that process. Because the consequence is that you will be known for who you are and what you are doing and how you present yourself. So in, in terms of irrational beliefs, I think if we move to the DNE, that in, in terms of the two examples we were talking about, I think the D and the E is the locker room talk that should be focusing on some of that at least. Uh, the psychologists don't always have the luxury to be there and to guide that, but in terms of the relationship with a coach who's going into that situation to address what is going on should at least be aware of the, the, the disputation of irrational beliefs and effective new beliefs that in that short span of time we should try and instill in the players and challenge their way of thinking and uh, help them find new ways of thinking about this game that is highly frustrating and driving them. And I think the coaches that, 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 can, that can deal with that process and what is being said there to assist those athletes to leave the locker room going into the second half with effective new rational beliefs that will support their goals and, and the values that they have, they have a better chance to come back and uh, defend their, their, their venture into this game uh, much better. This speaks to something you just said there, Leon. I remember Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool football manager or head coach, if you want to describe him that way, fielding a question from the press and, and, and somebody, a member of the press, asked him, is this a must-win game? And he actually very quickly responded, it's a like to win game, essentially. You know, we'd like to win this. It's not a must yes. win. So I'm not too sure if Jürgen Klopp has had any REBT training. Possibly has. There's a good sports <laughs> site there in Liverpool. So yes. um, maybe they've had that conversation. I mean, the the for what you're speaking to, to both of what you're speaking to here, this paper is about the integration of REBT, Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy, and specifically preferred REBT, and PST, PST being psychological skills training. And I think you've started to speak to this, James, and you're, you're both speaking about goal setting and the importance of setting rational goals. So this is the initial integration between these two approaches, REBT and PST, because I think perhaps historically it hasn't been recognized that psychological skills training or mental skills training which essentially consists of goal setting self-talk relaxation mm -hmm. techniques concentration etc is necessarily compatible with rebt but your paper is demonstrating it can so that starts with the goal setting doesn't it james that that's what i'm hearing you let's set rational goals here that's what you're both saying and also during a game a coach can be alive to the language that players are using and help them perhaps shift change reframe their language to turn down the volume of perfectionism must once etc james over to you you're giving me a thumbs up is that is that correct <laughs> that's exactly right yeah that's exactly uh, uh how i'd sum that up 
And uh, if we may, shall we go on to the uh, uh, idea of, of self-talk? Yes, please. Yeah. Now, you know, I was first introduced to the, the concept of, of self-talk uh, by, uh, again, the late uh, Paul Avis. He used to talk about the voices in one's head. And he was a clinical sports psychologist. I always used to find that funny. That he, he has the thing about voices in one's head. But, uh, the, you know, going back to my powerlifting days, voices in one's head is quite powerful. You know, um, the, the images and the voices, the things we tell, you know, those cue words we use. Uh, as a powerlifter, I used to use, you know, tight, strong, explode. These these keywords would would tell me what to do. Uh, again, like in a rugby uh, scrum, you know, tight, um, push. You you would use your the mm. keywords you've trained yourself. Yeah. Um, now, in in uh, very much linguistically, we as REBT uh, therapists, one is trying to teach people to use the preferred keyword. Yeah. Um, the like keyword, the want keyword, the preferred keyword, um, to basically, when when doing one's the D and the E, to refocus one's goals, um, then that's where the self talk comes in. So I prefer to get this the, to get this conversion. I prefer to hit the target. Um, if if other voices are coming into one's head, like you know what happens if you know the time is running out. Um, don't stuff up again <laughs> in order to try and refocus on your, your performance goals or what you're meant to be doing, use the preferred keyword just to bring yourself back. Um, and uh, it's again, uh, it's simple, but not simplistic. You know, it can with work and practice, it can reframe you uh, with that self talk to tell yourself what to do. So I always recommend start with a preferential a, a keyword and then go into a performance keyword of what you you would normally tell yourself to do unless you're going on automatic processing and not thinking about what you're doing you're at that skill level that's fine but use the preferred to get yourself into that instead of saying i must make a mistake i shouldn't stuff up uh it works and uh, i really would encourage yeah that any self-talk uh to 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 focus Start with the preferential, then focus on more performance oriented self talk. Uh, again, compatible. It's not unusual in REBT for self talk to to be part of the process. It's part of the internal disputing, anyway. Yeah. Dion, your yeah. your thoughts no, on self talk it, and REBT? It, it does make sense. So this now the skills on the skills level in in developmental processes, it's always about assisting the athlete to, to, to stay with positive self-talk at least you should back yourself you should be on your own side mm -hmm. and not be your own opponent with negative self-talk uh, but then move from positive self-talk to instructional self-talk right because what what is the, what is the last thought that directs the behavior yeah. it's giving the leg an instruction or giving the arm an instruction or uh, uh, sometimes, you know, there's no time for that because the, the self-talk can become an interference in itself, uh, especially if it is negative self-talk. Self, even instructional self-talk can sometimes be, uh, uh, we have to be cautious with it anyway, mm -hmm. but the skill should be taught and, and the athlete should experiment with, with what are the kind of thoughts that really support my performance what are the kind of thoughts that really take me forward? I think if we talk about the likes and the wants, it's more from a motivational perspective, thinking about the game and the outcome and the achievement of the goal. But when you are in the heat, in the spur of the moment, there shouldn't actually be thoughts in, 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 in many things that we do. But in some of the behaviors that we encounter, there could be a last instructional self-talk and then the execution of, of, of the movement or, or the event. Uh, but, but I think it is a very, very important part, part of the skills training of any athlete. Is how do you use that voice in your head? How do you speak to yourself? How do you use words and language that will push you forward in your venture rather than holding you back? 
I I love it. And, you know, we, we've spoken about self-talk on the sports section numerous times, not least with um, great sports psychologists like Dr. Noel Brick and, and Dr. Alex Latin-Jack, who are, who are two leading experts and researchers in, in this area. And I love what you're both saying here. And just briefly before we move on to, to uh, talking about imagery in REBT, obviously everything we're talking about is working in servitude Two, rationalizing our language and just briefly coming back to you, James, here around self-talk. I mean, if we're talking about G, A, B, C, D, E, and we're talking about the D, the disputation, you know, and I agree with you, Leon, completely that we want to turn down a volume of thought to the point of virtually no thought. But if we and, and also if we go to that Welsh Fiji game, my guess is you'd both agree that that the reality is that sometimes there has to be time for us to actively use our self-talk to dispute what thoughts we might be experiencing. Um, that if, What pops into our head is, wow, how are we playing like this? We should be absolutely annihilating this other team here. You know, we should be well in front. We're making so many silly mistakes. That that is your key to start, whether it's coming back to the instructional self-talk, the 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 keywords, but also maybe some extended sentences that enables us to dispute what we're thinking uh, in an effective manner. Uh, James, coming back to you here. Yes. So uh, again, with the, the platform being REBT, one would uh, f- first describe teaching the skill of self-talk as rational self-talk. So yes, one would actually be trying to, not must, but preferably avoiding the word positive because sometimes, and replacing it with rational, again, to use that common language mm. uh, of the of the, of the the uh, process. Um, and yes, so the, the, you know, it can all happen in, with work and practice. It can happen in a matter of seconds, split mm. seconds. Mm. Prefer that didn't happen. And then what are your performance goals? What do you need to do now? What does, uh, you know, is as simple as focus or reset, whatever that keyword is. Yeah. But again, that common language, yes, rational self-talk sounds better than self-talk in an REBT-centered program. I, I think the one thing, James, that 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 is, is in my mind now is that we sometimes have to think irrational about rational thinking. You must think this way. You have to think this way <laughs> because it's rational that's 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 what help us and the, the second thing i want to come back at is sometimes athletes get fixated on the way they think mm-hmm. especially if it is irrational the emotional drive behind irrational thinking is sometimes so complex so, so subconscious that they hold on to the thought and they will keep that irrational thought alive even after making two or three mistakes because of it. Uh, and I, th- I think what is important is, is, is for us to teach them a way to break that cycle of irrational thinking. At least become aware of it, that you are doing it. And once you have that awareness, you can then go to the d- disputing it and finding new ways of thinking. If you can't do that, if you don't have the D and the E in your arsenal, you're going to be fixated on irrational beliefs and find it very hard to break that circle that is just spiraling downwards. I love that thought. And a neat segue to um, think about imagery, um, our next psychological skill with relation to REBT. And I can imagine this is something that um, isn't often spoken about the relationship between imagery and REBT. So, James, mm. unpack this a little bit for us. Yes. Well, the, the term rational imagery is nothing new um, because uh, Ellis himself actually encouraged the use of imagery and visualize, and or visualization uh, as part of the clinical practice. Um, I know from, from I, I did martial arts for a while and uh, Imagery was quite uh, quite a powerful tool. <laughs> yes. um, I used to I used to you know when when uh, 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 doing conditioning I used to visualize uh, steel rods in my arms and I hurt a couple of blokes like that because <laughs> it did make me a lot more tougher than than yeah. other. Death. So imagery does work and it, it is part of of the the, the typical mainstream uh, clinical REBT thing, but. Um, 
he Ellis himself again he encouraged the use of it as long as it was accompanied with the D's um, disputing any irrational beliefs. And in terms of sports psychology practice, um, as as um, Leon mentioned, you know, you, when you have a deep seated irrational belief, a, a pattern of irrational beliefs that are affecting performance, one can use imagery to find those gross negative stuff in in C, go back in one's mind's eye, um, visualize the times we we lost control, the times uh, things went sideways, and then actively see how we could have used D and E to improve the situation and thereby start mentally practicing uh, using disputing. When things go sideways, how can you reset? You can bring in that preferential thinking, you can target those maths, um, practice that in, 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 in imagery as part of your normal imagery program with your actual play and technique stuff. It does complement uh, uh, each other and I, I think it works very well. Um, yes, and uh, imagery is so important. It's often interconnected, as you know, with self-talk. And uh, yeah, it's 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 a great uh, it's a great um, combination of rational self-talk and rational. <laughs> Again, trying to get the yeah. common language. Uh, it does work. And when players and coaches are using, um, encouraging this and with the sports psychologist, it, it works very well um, as, as a the common tongue of rationality, smart thinking, preferential thinking. Um, so those are my, my the thoughts that we, uh, some of the thoughts that were in the paper about uh, uh, rationality and, and imagery. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe just from my side to link with my previous point here, James, and that is how do we break this cycle of, of, of being fixated on irrational beliefs? I think, uh, and this is what we, we also the point we make in the article is sometimes imagine you make a mistake and how you turn this around and you change your thinking. It's a very dangerous statement, I know, because we don't want athletes to imagine making mistakes. Especially, you know, in terms of their, their physical skills, uh, you don't want them to, to imagine that. So rather than, the point is not to imagine making mistakes. The point is to imagine how, when you are in a situation like that, change the way you think about yourself and change the way you think about your, your skills and your play or the way you think about yourself in that moment so that you can build up an arsenal of different language, of empowering language when you are, when you caught yourself in, in irrational beliefs. How do I get out of this mud? How do I spin myself out of this process? And I think in terms of imagining how you become aware and how you have a different language, that's the point we want to make, not to imagine making mistakes because you always imagine yourself executing skills successfully. Uh, but, but in itself, that is a mental skill itself that we can, that we can imagine ourselves employ uh, during play, getting out of that way of thinking that is not supportive and breaking that cycle to move towards more rational types of beliefs, getting perspective, making new decisions about where I am and where I can take it from here. The couple of things, Leon, reflecting back to you that you made me think about there as you were speaking, and and, and that number one, the the psychological skill of mental contrasting, uh, mm -hmm. and as as you say, we probably don't want athletes entrenched in thoughts around mistakes, but at the same time, we do want them to understand what they're going to do, who they're going to be, how they're going to go about um, their game. Uh, when a uh, mistake happens or, or, or when poor play happens. So to speak to your point there, you know, utilizing imagery to, to be able to, to, to do that. And the other mm -hmm. thing, uh, and whether it's related to imagery, I think everything, just about everything is because that's going on all the time, just about anyway. But as you were speaking there, it was, uh, making me think of something that uh, the neuroscientist uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett from Harvard University spoke about on the Sports Site Show and has written about in her books uh, about emotion, and that's emotional granularity. When we've got the language to broaden our experiences of emotion, and obviously we can transfer it, we've got 
language that broadens our experiences of who we are when we're competing, then we have more of a, a schematic or more tools, if you like, in our toolbox that enables us to deal with the challenges that are thrown at us. We can do this, we can do that, we can become this, we can become that in those moments. So no question, guys, but it was just making my mind uh, think of those kind of things, Leon, as you were speaking there. I, I always uh, begin with a metaphor which, which links with the neurological processes that are involved and try to make it as simple and basic as possible for athletes. Mm. Now, in psychology, we study the thinking, the feeling, and the behavior of a person. Mm. And, and information is processed through the brain in a specific way in, 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 in this context. Yes. Whatever we see, whatever we experience, goes through the emotional brain first. Mm. So, so, so in terms of REBT, the emotional experience and everything that is loaded behind that emotion moves us to a thinking process. And that emotional and thinking process directs the way we execute our skills or how we behave. And, and imagery, I think, is one of the most powerful tools an athlete can have to combine the experience of all three of those. Because every, every image has got an emotional and a cognitive and a behavioral aspect to it that could be caught in one process. Um, and, and I think that is why it is so powerful. Uh, don't imagine mistakes. Imagine the way you work your way out of it and how you create in terms of that granular process, new language that will affect your behavior better or more effective uh, in, in those contexts is, I think, where we can zoom in uh, if, if we link it with REBT. Love it. We've got two more psychological skills training areas to cover uh, before we finish. Uh, relaxation techniques would be the next one, James. Would you like to uh, relate relaxation techniques with REBT, rational motive behavior? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so as we know that one cannot be physically aroused and anxious and relaxed at the same time. Mm. Hence, that's the idea of, of breathing exercises and uh, progressive relaxation to physiologically bring one down. And sometimes when you when you speaking about the the, the, the framework in, in consequence, see when you're overly aroused, <laughs> uh, just to to reset. There's nothing wrong with doing a, a relaxation routine um, just to bring one down. But to complement that, uh, I would say one cannot be in a state of gross negative emotions, totally ra rageful and completely and utterly rational at the same time. Uh, you know, the, the, you can't be a must. You can't be musting in your mind and uh, uh, children in your mind. So. Yeah, I think to complement those those relaxation routines, whatever you're using, whatever the therapist is is using, whatever it be, even mindfulness or whatever, there's nothing wrong with using a bit of preferred thinking to say, prefer that I wasn't upset. There were you don't experience secondary upsets. You know, I prefer I didn't lose control. Uh, that uh, that instead of I shouldn't have lost control, and then that brings down. Uh, the, the the dial of of those distracting gross negative emotions. So please, yeah, use uh, REBT can be used uh, either before relaxation or complementary. And again, a bit of positive reinforcement with a work in practice. You you use both together. Um, I remember years ago, uh, I lived in New Zealand for a couple of years and the workplace environment was a bit toxic and I was the only foreigner there and we had a, a cycle of staff coming and going. I couldn't go anywhere because I was under a work contract. Uh, but I would use relaxation routines in staff meetings and I no one could, you know, I knew I couldn't upset myself, you know, because you, in REBT you upset yourself and I would write prefer on my notepad and no one... No one could get under my skin, and I was <laughs> ultimately that was just a more practical than the sports illustration. But it does work. One can use progressive relaxation and preferential thoughts at the same time um, mm -hmm. to reinforce each other, and again, it, it complements it. Yeah. Leon, your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. A theory sometimes uh, 
help us to understand that somatic anxiety and cognitive anxiety, two very different things and should be treated differently. I think they are more integrated, but I think the one precedes the other. I, I, I think somatic anxiety, taking a breath and letting it go, precedes cognitive anxiety and dealing with cognitive anxiety. That's the thing. That, that, that's that. When you say so, somatic anxiety is essentially anxiety experienced in the body and cognitive in the, in body. the mind. In the mind, yes, 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 okay. yes. yes. Yeah, the ones in the body, the ones in the mind, and and you know, taking a breath uh, will will relax the body, but not the mind necessarily. So we also need a thinking pattern or a process that will help us to deal with the cognitive anxiety, these irrational beliefs. That, that that's creating and generating this nervousness and anxious experience that I have. So relaxation helps with that, but cognitive relaxation, much more from an REBT point of view, is to 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 empower the athlete with the kind of thinking that will also calm them down in the mind. You know, so it's it's also one of those cycle breakers I think that one can employ to 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 help athletes um, calm down cognitively and th start thinking more rationally about where they are and what they are doing love it and um last but not least big one this one james concentration training tell us a little bit about the relationship between concentration training and preferred rational motor behavior therapy again yeah uh, yes again the distinction between um preferential rbt and uh, other forms of, of CBT is the idea that negative emotions aren't always the bad thing. You know, it's just a, the degree. So uh, in terms of concentration, um, some negative emotions will impact your concentration and your focus poorly, such as anxiety, fear, anger, rage, depression, being hurt by other players. You know, uh, these... Uh, affects your concentration, these gross, distracting, negative emotions. And REBT does teach you, uh, like some of the, the, the third wave uh, therapies claim uh, they do as well, to, to actually perform in the presence of these uh, negative emotions and, you know, to stick to one's values. REBT does teach you to do that, but what it can also do uh, as not only uh, perform regardless of your emotion. It can also teach you to turn down the anxiety and turn it into concern, to turn down the anger and rage and turn it into annoyance, to turn down the depression and to sadness where you, you can actually carry on focusing. You know, those are still negative emotions, but they're appropriate negative emotions in negative situations. And so you can continue to perform. Um, and focus on what you need to focus. So if you use those preferential thoughts um, and not make yourself artificially positive, you know, five minutes to go, your team's behind you, whoopee, we can do this, let's all be positive. It doesn't always work, but you can always be rational. And, uh, or you at least try to be. Again, nothing's perfect, not even preferential preferred thinking. So, but you can at least try to use preferred thoughts about what's happening. This will re orientate your goals, going back to G, to, uh, G, have more rational thoughts and be able to focus on what you need to focus on. Um, yeah, that's the, the underlying idea. And um, that is the, the, the main focus of, of all this uh, uh, preferential thinking is to be able to focus what you need to focus on um, by getting those distracting, extreme negative emotions Turn down to focus on what you need to focus on. In a, in a simple sense, uh, that is what a prefer preferential REBT practitioners would would aim to do in a sports context. What I'm hearing you say is that as we compete, we might experience um, an activating event, the A, that um, uh, dis maybe distracts us or narrows our our, our concentration our our attention and um what rebt where my rebt might come in it might it might share we're going to be real psychologists in this moment it might share philosophies that are drawn from act acceptance commitment training in as much as 
you know, we accept the emotion that we're experiencing. But what I'm hearing you say there, James, is that in your world, in the REBT, the preferred REBT world, that we actually can start to turn down the volume of of that emotion to potentially turn up the volume of concentration or to broaden our concentration if broadening it is 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 necessary. You know, and we can come back to a range of things. We can simply direct our attention onto the most appropriate cues. We could probably come back to self-talk. We can come back to imagery and those kind of things in order to be able to help us concentrate better. That's the kind of thing I'm I'm hearing here, here the robust nature of a preferred rational emo- emotive behavioral approach. Uh, Leon, uh, any any thoughts yourself here? Yeah, I, I think the primary th- thinking here is that the irrational thought should not become the focus of attention. Okay. The moment you, you focus too much on those kind of things, you are distracted in any yes. way. Your mind's not in the game anymore. Your, your mind's not where it should be. And and irrational thoughts have this tendency. It's, got, it's quite powerful to draw your attention inwards. And, and uh, a.k.a. Nidifer, you might have an internal narrow or maybe an internal wide way of thinking while you are busy playing. And you don't want that in terms of, of performance. You want the athletes to be focused externally, executing their moves, getting information and making decisions, getting information and executing moves. That That is the space of focus, of attention you want during during a game with the occasional internal process of just reconnecting to game plans, making decisions with confidence, and then move out there again. But irrational thoughts have this ability to get you stuck in an internal frame of mind, of focus, of attention. And to break that pattern, I think REBT can empower us as well with the kind of language, the kind of processes that will get you out of there very quickly to reconnect to the game and focus your attention to where it should be. That DE process is, I think, also very important for focus of attention. When you're stuck inside, you've got to find a way to get out and back into the game again. Love what you've done there. You've related, um, you've you've related everything to the work of Robert Nidifer and his direction of attention and width of attention and uh, a general hypothesis is from very many sports that we by and large want a, a, either a, a, an external narrow or external wide focus of attention in order to draw information from our environment or to have a, a strong target focus. And uh, uh, when we experience a lot of emotion, we can tend to turn that attention inwards, uh, that internal uh, narrow or inter- internal wide uh, attention. Uh, so if we rationalize, if we draw down the volume of emotion, maybe we can externalize our focus of attention. I absolutely Thank love you. that. Yeah, absolutely. And where I would like to finish here, I mean, absolutely fascinating stuff. And I, I love any episode that we do where we're trying to make sense between uh, frameworks, approaches, concepts, tools, techniques, which I think we've done in a very rich uh, form today. We've got so many different people listening in. Uh, We've got coaches, we've got sports psychology practitioners, uh, researchers, we've got key stakeholders working in sport. Um, For everybody listening in, putting, putting you both under a little bit of pressure here, um, I'd love to get some takeaway thoughts from you. I mean, for everybody listening in, what 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 two or three hints, tips, ideas, philosophies, or just you know um, overarching thoughts might you provide for, for for our audience today? Again, bearing in mind there's a sort of a rich cross section of participants um, within sport listening in. Um, I don't mind if we want to come to James first or Leon. You guys can choose whoever you want. What what one, <laughs> two or three takeaways might our audience um, uh, draw from this conversation? Okay, maybe I can start this time around and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave the floor to our expert in REBT, James, to, to close the, the, the floor. Uh, the one thing I want to want to stress is 
as coaches, we have to model a way of thinking mm. that meets our expectations when working with athletes, e even as psychologists, that the way we think and the way we think about ourselves as coaches, athletes are going to pick up on them. So be also mindful that you as a coach speak the language of rational expectations and rational beliefs uh, so that the athletes can pick up on that. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes we have a way of thinking and a skill, especially in self-talk and imagery, that, uh, that, that might be interfering, that might be negative, that might be difficult. And the idea of a psychologist is to change that and change that behavior. But not always. Sometimes you have to acknowledge this is how my brain works. If, if I'm in a situation like this, my brain wants to really generate a lot of anxiety for me. Oh, there it's doing it again. And more a mindfulness approach to acknowledge that this is the way I sometimes think. And regardless of that, I'm going to follow a rational thought or a value or an idea in how I want to be known as, as an athlete or how I want to be known in executing these skills. Uh, so that sometimes we cannot change a mind. It's difficult to change a mind or a thought. Sometimes it's just an automatic thought. At least become aware of it, acknowledge it, and then find a way how to let that go or just, just let it be and perform the way you want to anyway. I don't know if that makes sense. It's more of a, of, of a mindful approach to say, this is what the mind does. Let me give them stick anyway. And let me Love give it. myself the best chance anyway. Love it. I Love it. Leon, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. And James. Yeah, I would just conclude by saying, think preferred thoughts about today, what's happening around you, what's happening in the, the, the play. Think preferred thoughts about the past. You know, the past is past. And think preferred thoughts about the future. And in all situations, realize that you can choose the mildest negative feeling in every negative situation. And uh, yeah, the, uh, these these tools are available there developed by a super genius <laughs> and they seem so uh simple but then they're not you know they are simple but they're not simplistic they're clever and you know everyone can benefit from them i've i've taught this to recovering drug addicts and they all would say i'm naturally a preferred thinker and then without having drugs for a while they, the must thinker <laughs> comes out of him and they could it's always someone can use the this this knowledge it can increase the quality of your life can increase your toughness um, and it's very applicable in sport. Um, and yeah, if, uh, um, I, I think uh, we could all benefit from just being a bit more flexible and more uh, um, preferred orientated. Brilliant. James, thank you so much. Thank you. Leon, James, that was absolutely just a wonderful conversation. I can't thank you both enough. Really rich, uh, and 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 I think from from my perspective, also really interesting to hear from both of you and the, the the similarities and also subtle differences in both of your lenses of the world. Um, so maybe that's just me picking up on on, on certain things, but I think that that's the, the 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 wonderful thing about our profession is the 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 different approaches, uh, but whilst also um, recognizing that there's uh, uh, different advantages to to different ways of looking looking at various human challenges. I know that you will have tapped the interest of all those listening in. Um, so uh, I think uh, Leon will come to you first. How can people find you, follow you, and get in contact if you wish to be contacted? Yeah, no, people are welcome to, to email me uh, if they go to the website of the University of Fort Hare or they just Google my name, they'll find a way to get to me. Um, uh, my phone number is also out on the web there. So so it's it's leonvn at ufh.ac.za. That's where they can contact me. And uh, uh, yeah, people are always welcome. Uh, so, so if you Google my name, you'll find contact details of me there through various psychology platforms. 
Perfect. Thank you, Leon and James. How can people find you, follow you, and get in contact? Yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm you. So, be able to find me at uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal, um, and um, I, I hope on your uh, platform you'll be able to 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 give my email address if they need it. Uh, also, hopefully, a link to my PhD if you're interested in the topic of REBT and how it compares to a mindfulness acceptance commitment type approach. Um, maybe a, a shameless plug for a future. Uh, podcast <laughs> we can we can Absolutely. dive into that um how the the two compare and contrast and what the results of an experiment were um and then yeah uh, again a, a shameless plug for martin's book which is uh very much an uh, inspiration to me the rational practitioner yeah. um if i if i ever hit england he owes me a pint or two for plugging <laughs> his book but it is it is if if you're interested in the, the the particularly the abc framework the g a b c d e framework and its application in in um psychological skills training yeah please look at that book um it is uh, uh, the quintessential uh, authority on that topic as as well as our journal article which i hope we can link to the platform as well um thank you'll, you thank you so much james and you'll be delighted to hear that actually if people go back to episode 226 of the sports site show they would be able to listen to me speak for a good hour and a quarter to martin uh, about his book the rational practitioner so um it is a, it is indeed a wonderful book so i can't thank you both enough thank you so much for the conversation today and uh, i look forward to speaking with you both in the future thanks so much thank you so much dan it was a, it was a, a, a real interesting experience and thanks for having us real privilege thank you guys well everybody i really enjoyed that podcast and i'd love to hear what you the listener think so please do get in touch via twitter or facebook or through my website danabrahams.com to tell me what you think of the show and if you do have any suggestions i'd be delighted to hear them i'm already looking forward to next week's episode bye for now <laughs>